Uh, good afternoon, I'm Brother Lawrence from Shamaran High School, and this is uh, January 12th, 2005. And we have the honor uh, this afternoon of interviewing Mr. Charles Martin Tynan, who is a, in the Marine Corps as a corporal. And with me doing the interviewing is Robert Gazzo, who is a member of the Social Studies Club, and uh, Daniel Ostinaccio, sorry about that, and uh, also a member of the Social Studies Club. Uh, we thank you, of course, for giving up your time coming here, and over the course of the next half hour, 45 minutes, hour, whatever you want, we're going to try and explore some of the things that you've written in your uh, official basic information, and then ask you a series of questions. Naturally, at any point, if you think the questions are invasive or you don't want to answer them, you just say, uh, I, let's move on to the next question, or I prefer to answer uh, something else. Um, Oh, we'll start with Robert, uh, who asked you the first question. For the war, um, did you volunteer or were you drafted for it? First, let me say thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your asking me. Uh, your teacher, Pete uh, Osiri, he asked me. I appreciate him asking me. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, I enlisted, yes. Okay. At the uh, time that you enlisted, were a lot of people in, in your area enlisting, or did you come? How did you get there? How did I get there? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, at the time, was, uh, we were only five years past World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, they had instituted a draft uh, for the Korean War, and I was not waiting for a draft. I wanted to enlist, and I wanted to do my part. And so I enlisted down on Whitehall Street in Manhattan. Okay. How old were you? Nineteen. Nineteen when you did that. Right. And, um, did you have a job at that point? Or did you well, I tell you, I was just talking about being at Shaman High School. I went to Newtown High School, and mm -hmm. I that at that time they graduated in the winter time and the summertime, and I was short physics. Uh, I got to be a wise guy. I got to be too smart for my own britches. Okay. And I was short, and so I had to go to Delahanty, uh, Delahanty Institute in Jamaica to make up uh, the one class, and I went for physics, and I passed it, and I got my uh, diploma then. And then as soon as I graduated from high school, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. All right, so you, in, in that words, you didn't have a, like a little layover where you were working at a job or well, something? Well, I was working all the time. I've been working since I was eight years old, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I was working for a Venetian wine company, and uh, I was working right up until the time I uh, was enlisted in the Marine Corps, yes. Oh, okay. Daniel? Tell us a little bit about your training. Where exactly did you train? Uh, well, I went to Paris Island. That's uh, where all the Marines from the East Coast, from the Mississippi mm -hmm. River uh, East, from the Mississippi River East, all of the people who go into the Marine Corps at that time, and I still think it's the same way, go to Paris Island. Mm -hmm. And that's what they call boot camp. I was in boot camp for about 12 weeks. Um, and they put you through a various amount of psychological, mental, physical, um, what shall I call it, strenuous times, um, many different things in training, from rifles, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, judo, the knives, uh, map reading, uh, many military things, training, um, discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, during that time, uh, now, of course, you knew when, when you enlisted, you knew we were fighting in Korea, or w were we already fighting in Korea? Oh, yeah, we okay. were, yes, we were. So we were already fighting in Korea, so you had no illusions. You would know you probably were going to go to Korea, or not? Well, you know, I really don't remember, but I, probably not. Okay. I mean, I was gung-ho, but I don't think I was that gung-ho at the moment. I really don't remember. Okay. I mean, did I say I wanted to go right away? And I hear I, no, I don't think I did that. <laughs> no, I okay, I, because... I don't think I did yeah, that. It wasn't automatic that you went to the Marines and go to go to Korea, but it was pretty close. Well, it was pretty yeah. close, but yeah. did I say, oh, yeah, i got to go, I'm going? No, yeah. I, I wasn't rushing to go. Let's okay. Put it that way. That's okay. fair enough. Yeah. Um, the, the reason for that question was, uh, in your training, were they talking about Korea? All the time. Okay. Well, I was trained by World War II Marines, by uh, uh, Guadalcanal Marines and uh, Canal, uh, Okinawa. Uh, those Marines were, were training us. They were our DIs and they were training the recruits because, don't forget, World War II was only over five years. Right. So our training was from World War II Marines. Now, did you see maps? Did they talk about Korean culture? 
Uh, they no, didn't try no, to teach you the no, language or anything. No, no, nothing about the country, nothing, absolutely nothing. Okay. No culture. Right. Okay. Um, what was the hardest part about your training during boot camp? You're not stumped by a freshman, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hate, I, I didn't have any problem. Oh, really? I, I could do everything physically. I was an athlete, mm -hmm. and I was in good condition. And what they try to do is they try to, and now I'm only speaking for the Marine Corps, I can't speak for anybody else. They try to break you down psychologically um, and physically. Mm -hmm. But I could do all the physical stuff. So what happens is if you could do all the physical stuff, the DI left you alone. <laughs> yeah. That's... Yeah, well, you know, I could do all the physics. I could do the swimming. I could do the running. I could do the jumping. I could do the calisthenics. I could do the uh, manual arms. I could handle the rifle. I, I, I was good in the rifle range. So well, did I have a real hard time on anything? No. Uh, in high school, were you on teams? Is that how you I got played for the American shape? Legion Baseball. I played basketball. I couldn't play for Newtown High School because I had to work. Right. Right. Uh, see, I had to work, mm -hmm. family-wise. Right. But I played from the day, I, you know, from the day I was like this, and I played ball all the time, and I still play, mm -hmm. you know, here and there. Uh -huh. So I really didn't have, I really didn't have a problem. Thank God. And and as you said, because of the physical, and you were able to keep up with that, they didn't push you psychologically. Well, you know, you have to think about a Marine Corps at that time, um, and everybody says, you know, Marine Corps was it's a piece of cake now, but. There was, let's say, 60 guys in the barracks, and, and you got four DIs, drill instructors, right. and they're there to, to break you down. They, they want to break you down. They don't want you to be in there. In other words, the, if you've got 60 guys, maybe 40 are going to make it, right. and maybe they're not. Right. So, um, and of course, being my last name was Tynan, I'm way down the end. See, they go alphabetically, so they get a guy like him, they get him first, he's down there, <laughs> get after him because that's where the, the door is, and I'm down the end. Uh, I didn't have any problem. I really, f honestly, did not have it because I could do the physical part. If right. you couldn't do the physical part, some guys were heavy, every yard. I was skinny, and they would be after those guys because they couldn't maneuver as good. But they got to the point, right. you know. I mean, I could do all the gym stuff, and uh, so I didn't have any problem. Did you do that, like the climbing of the ropes? And yeah, the yeah, just like you guys do gym here. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't throw hand grenades, but... No, 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 that's a different story. Rope, I, yeah. I'm saying I could do all yeah. physical things that that's, had that's to be great. done. Um, th th this is uh, one of those questions. By the way, you can ask yeah. me anything you want. Don't hold back anything. Okay. If I don't want to answer, I'll tell you. All right. During your training, w was anybody hurt? Oh, definitely. Many times. Got broken bones, broken arms, broken fingers. Oh, definitely, yeah. Because you're not just sitting in gym, you know. I mean, yeah. And then, of course, you. Uh, the most serious parts was when you have the drill instructors. Well, actually, it wasn't really the drill instructors. It was outside specialists in, in, in judo and jujitsu. And then you got hand to hand, and you got you know with the clothes and bangs and pulling and. Um, I'm after the big guys, you know, six foot four, 240 pounds, and uh, they're throwing me around, and I'm trying to throw them around. So yes, you're going to get hurt. You're going to hurt your back, and yeah, many guys get hurt. Yes, uh, no one, no one died. No one died. Okay. No, no, we didn't have any. We went through swamps, and that, no, no one died. I mean, no, okay. not dead. No. Because that, I mean, that always happens. It can happen. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you're swinging on ropes, and yeah, you're doing various things that can hurt you. Um, in the war, you indicated that um, you were at one point a scout and a sniper. Um, where and when? Uh, well, I went to Korea in 1951 in September, mm -hmm. and I went to Pusan. And that was a landing area right in a, down in the far right-hand corner, you know, just where I can think of. And then I was um, transported by uh, a C-47. Transport about 10 or 12 of us, and I joined my outfit who were in the reserve. And then I was placed in George Company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. And that was, I wasn't even near being a sniper at that time. I was a, I was a freshman. Mm -hmm. And I had a guy who was my squad leader, 
who was only a little bit bigger than you. And he was from Fort Tucker, Rhode Island. And his name was Colin Boyle. And he was the bravest Marine I ever seen. So to get to this, I got a long way before I got to be a sniper and a scout. Uh, well, now... Uh, you know, does he want me to jump from, from where I no, am? No, we'll, we'll go from Pusan now. You, uh, that's, we're setting up a perimeter of defense in so that we can bring well, No, 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 that, that, well, I'm right. after that. It, okay. that. All of that happened around 1950 when they right. first, the first, all that problems happened. I got there a year into the war. Okay. It was a year into the war. When I got there, I joined my outfit who was in reserve. Um, the 1st Marines were in reserve and the 5th and 7th Marines were on line. Now, I was in a, re that's a regiment, 1st right. Marine Regiment. The regiment, there's three regiments in a division, and I was in the 1st Marine Division. So my regiment that I joined, which I didn't know I was going, I didn't know where I was going, uh, they were in reserve, and then about three days after I got there, we called what we jumped off. We went into the attack, and I went up to Teju, and we were then pushing the North Koreans north right. in the attack. So we were then in an attack. So uh, at, at no, well... At no point were you taken out for the Incheon landing. You continued. Oh no, I was after. Forward. I was after. I, I'm after. Oh, the Incheon, Incheon, Incheon landing, landing already was taking place. Oh, right, and so did the Chesa chosen reservoir. I'm okay. a year after that. Uh, MacArthur landed with the uh, Incheon in, um, well, in 1950. I think it was early 19. As a matter of fact, when you see, did you ever see them landing on Incheon? Did you ever see? Yeah. Did you yeah. ever see the guy that coming out of the, the landing boat? You know, he's, that's the, what they show all. He's a, he was a lieutenant and he got killed in Seoul. He, that was the 1st Marines. That was my regiment. Come, he comes out of the Higgins boat. But no, I was not there. I was a year after that. I, I, they call it the uh, uh, 1951 offensive. See, they various operations during the war. Right. So now you're, you're pushing north. Now how far does your particular unit get? I would have no idea. Well, I mean, you know, we you were out the, there. Did you ever get to Seoul? I mean, are you fighting Oh, I fight Seoul? Seoul, yeah. Well, well yeah. see, I was, we were in two different, um, two different parts of the country. There's the West Coast and the East Coast. Mm -hmm. We were on, on see the West Coast, i got to get my bearings now. Um, we were in a mountainous area. Okay. Pushing forward, we were all in the mountains. I'm, I'm talking mountains. I'm not, oh, talking, yeah. I'm not yeah. talking nickel and dime stuff right. here. I'm talking in the mountains. Uh, when we're pushing forward, um, uh, we're in the attack. Mm -hmm. And the North Koreans are in retreat. Right. But they have a rear guard operation. So uh, do we push forward? Yes. How far do we go? If I tell you we go five miles, I don't remember. I really don't. We just, But we're moving like this. Right. Everybody is moving. Right. There's two regiments moving and one regiment behind it in the mm -hmm. attack. And we were in an attack like that, an attack mode for over a month. Now, would it be correct to assume that, I know the mountain range goes north-south up, um, uh, up the peninsula. Would it be correct to say that at sometimes you're on the eastern side of that mountain range and sometimes on the oh, western side of the mountain and, range? And in the valleys, etc. You know, depending on where we were going, depending on where your outfit was assigned, if you were assigned to go up the mountain, so go that direction, that's where you went. Mm -hmm. If somebody was in the valleys, that's where they went. But actually, you, they were sending you where they, they were, where they were mm -hmm. because we wanted to push them back. And they were entrenched. They, they had foxholes, and they, they were entrenched. And they had a rear guard, and they were trying to stop us from keep going. Right. Did you um, take any prisoners? At that particular time, yeah. no. Not at that particular time. Yeah. But I did take prisoners later, yes. Okay. Now... When do we switch from you moving forward to you getting like special assignments? Like I think a scout is a special assignment. Well, Sniper is there a special is assignment. in the there are uh, basically the Marines or what I was. We were in a squad. The squad mm -hmm. is thirteen men. They have three fire teams in the squad, and between a fire team, you have a fire team leader, you have a scout, you have a barman, which means a, a Browning automatic rifleman and right. an assistant. Um, mm -hmm. When I got there, I was an assistant barman. Now, that's the lowest of the totem pole. And then eventually I worked my way up until being a scout and a sniper. And then past that, I was a fire team leader okay. before I left. But then we're pushing on. I mean, we're jumping ahead. We're jumping ahead. Um, when I was originally there in the beginning, uh, we were in the attack 
like I said, for well, a month. And what happens is, after you're in an attack, and this is daytime, we're doing this daytime, then you set up or dig in at night. And you dig in at night, and then that's when they come out. See, the North Koreans and the Chinese, because I fought both of them on both coasts, uh, then they come out and they start to bang them, and they start to play the bugles. But of course, those bugles, don't forget, are uh, like the cavalry. They have, uh, they're saying, oh, charge, or don't charge, or come back, or go left, go right. So when you hear them, because we didn't know that, time, but they're telling their troops what to do. Right. See, just when, when they say, you know, pop, 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 out like that, they're telling them what to do. So they would attack us at night, and they would, wherever we were, because we were digging in, and then they would pull back. In other words, hit and run, hit and run. That's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. How many months did that last? Well, uh, that lasted, I, I got there, uh, and that lasted September, uh, maybe a little bit into November, and then Ridgeway came in. Uh, General Ridgeway, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, he decided that we are going to have a stalemate. Everybody's going to dig in mm -hmm. at this particular area where maybe I don't remember exactly, but we were going to dig in. And now we started to do trench warfare, like World War One, mm -hmm. and we all dug trenches. Of course, the Marines don't dig too good. <laughs> we don't dig too good. Well, uh, we started dig trenches, and, and uh, the Koreans, which were uh, four or five hundred yards in front of us, maybe not even for that far, they started digging. So then, that was a stalemate. And then, right. where we were, of course, there were many patrols going on at all at this time. I'm not saying that we were sitting in here, but there was a stalemate going, and the winter came in. Is that 52? 51. I'm still, still in, 50, 51. I'm still in okay. 51. I'm still in 51. I'm probably um, in the end of November now. I've only been there two months. So yeah. I'm yeah. only there two months. And now we're digging in, and the winter comes in. Well, the snow and the cold. And don't forget, I'm digging in. We're in the ground. Yeah. We, like I said, we don't dig too good. Uh, we're freezing out behind you. It is unbearable. And we're up in, we're in the mountains, 20 below zero with the wind, with the snow. And, God. And then, of course, you get no hot food, you know. Uh, so they can, you don't do anything. When it's 20 degrees, you don't do a thing. They don't do anything. We don't do anything. The um, rifles, the artillery, um, you know, does, don't operate properly. So I would say, unless uh, all of November, well, half of November, December, and January, stalemates. Really nothing. They had artillery duels, and we had some kind of patrols, but the... Um, the contact between us and the enemy, very minimal, even though we had patrols out. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I, I'm bringing myself up to, let's say, January now. Now I'm in 1952. Um, but we here, we're going to move from the East Coast to the West Coast. The reason we're moving is because the Chinese are massing in that area, and this is an area where they want to come down, I'm going to call it the slot, it's not the slot, it's like a valley which runs right down towards Seoul. Right. And they wanted the 1st Marine Division to come over there because we're the best and to stop it. Now would you be north of Seoul when you move? Yes, we're north of Seoul. Okay. We're, we're north and we're to the, more to the east. Well, I was on both coasts by the way. Right, yeah. And I just want to yeah. throw this one thing in. If you ever, we was in, in, in the west coast in, in the mountains one time. And we had what you call a forward observer from the Navy. And he was calling in artillery from the ships out at sea, because the ships were out here. And they were sending over artillery, the, the ships, mm -hmm. firing from the ship. It sounded like the Long Island Railroad coming at 100 miles an hour. What a sound that was. <laughs> and over there where that building is, that's where they were landing. And then you could feel them right. And just for another story, we went to Washington, my wife and I, for the uh, Korean um, memorial. And my son, who went with us, and his wife, he is a friend who is in the Democratic Party and knows uh, Glenn, John Glenn's. And right. So we went into John Glenn's office, and John Glenn's an ex-Marine also, and of course he was in the Air Corps. And Ted Williams, you guys know Ted Williams? Okay. He was his wingman. Ted Williams was his wingman. Yeah. And he took out a piece of uh, shrapnel out of his desk, 
and he showed us the shrapnel which was in his plane, which was in the tail of his plane. But that was okay. But the most important thing what he told us, he says, you want to see my medal? I says, of course. I mean, John, uh, John, uh, the Senator Glenn, he's a real hero. That's a hero. That's an American hero. Comes out of a drawer and he takes out a medal. That's only seven medals in the whole country. Remember the seven astronauts that first started? Yeah. He got a congressional medal from the president. Only seven of them for a congressional astronaut medal. And anyway, it was a very, very enlightening that when we spoke to Glenn. And it was good. And, and he was telling us about uh, Ted Williams and uh, the planes. And um, I, I know about the planes because the planes came over us. They had what you have. Uh, panels, and they have uh, arrows in the different panels, green, blue, whatever. And the plane would come over, not from behind us, parallel. And uh, they would call in and they would drop them and it made that close, closer, closer, mm -hmm. you know, very close. Anyway, that was a side story with Glenn. Now they were dropping napalm, is that what you going to Oh say? yeah, uh, we were dropping napalm. Uh, we were, we Navy were dropping Corsairs, Navy Corsairs plane would come over like this. And then they would, when we were in the attack, uh, they would come in with their planes. They would, you know, we'd call for air support because we couldn't dig them out. Uh, right. You know, we'd call for air support, and the air support, the guys from the planes, would, and these were not carrier-based planes, these were land-based planes. Uh, and they would give us uh, support. So, uh, I, I'm about um, getting almost to March, because we changed in March. We moved, so I would say we had a stalemate there, and then we moved from the, that coast to the uh, west coast, up into that slot uh, to stop the Chinese who were very, very active in that area against the American Army and the Rocks, and the Rocks are the uh, Republican um, officers of Korea, I forget what, the, the, the Korean Army. Right. And the Chinese were, were beating these guys up. So we did relieve them in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And then we started to get very, they started to get active with us too also. So the war started, quotes on quotes, to pick up you know, for us, for us. Mm -hmm. and, and Ridgeway is still in charge. Oh yeah, he's, he's still in charge, but we're still in that uh, holding, uh, for holding pattern. In other words, the trench lines, main line of resistance, and, and then the war became outpost operations. Most, all of the back and forth with uh, patrols. It's a World War One all over again. Yeah. It's World War One. that's what it was. For us it was World War One in the trenches. And then we were constantly um, on patrol, constantly on patrol, every night. And then that's where I became the sniper. Um, did you live in the trenches? And um, if, if you did, what was life like? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. Yes, I lived in the trenches. Yes. Yes, a kid from the city of New York. Yes, it was, it was terrible. Probably rats and, and I, stuff. You know, I, it was cold. It was cold then. Um, in the heat, you can take stuff off. And I could live with the heat because, you know, you play ball and you sweat, but it's so cold. It's numb and cold and the wind was blowing, it was terrible. And we don't build good. The Chinese and the North Koreans, they built down in a... The Americans, it's, they don't... That's not their bag. That yeah. wasn't our bag. Yeah. We just... I mean, we dug a hole and, you know, then after a while when the incoming came, you dug a little bit deeper and you, you put this on top of it. It was very bad. Very... The weather was horrendously terrible, cold. Terrible. And he too. But the cold got to me. I, I couldn't take the cold. And neither could everybody else. What was that? You said something about rats? Oh. Oh yeah. With um, I remember like we learned that there, that there were deadly rats in the trenches in World War One. Was it the same in Korea too? No, not really. We didn't have vomits. Or, no, I, I can't say we had them. If we did have them, we pushed them away. You know, we didn't pay attention to them really. But I mean, uh, we could blow them up in a heart, you know, <laughs> blow ourselves up. So no, it, no, we didn't. That that, that wasn't our problem. It just was the cold, you know. And we were in in the mountains, yeah. just like upstate New York. Right. And you will look up there, and of course they were all barren because they had so much shells on them, so they're all brown, you know. And then you're digging, but uh, listen, I'd rather be digging it than dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. And how how deep are some of the trenches you guys dug? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it got to be the shoulder length. Yeah, it got to be shoulder length. You know, because you had, to, you had to be able to shoot from there. And uh, I mean, I, I'm saying that we didn't do a good job, and, and I'm sure we did a better than adequate job, but we did not do as good a job as the as the Koreans or the uh, Chinese, because when we did take those um, areas that they were in, we seen what they did in comparison to what we did. 
And of course, we had engineers too, but don't forget the weather was so cold. You have to blast holes. You, you, you can't yeah. dig, it's, it's freezing. You can't yeah. dig. And then when you get artillery coming in or mortars coming in, I mean, that's dangerous, you know, so. Well, we did the best we could under the circumstances. Now, it's during this time that you become a sniper? During this time, yeah, when the weather, when the weather changed uh, from got cold, we started coming to the spring. Mm -hmm. And the weather changes just like here. And, uh, no, and then I became a sniper, yes. Uh, and now, what was, now, it's going to sound like a dumb question. Uh, did you get particular assignments or you, did you get a position? Both. Um, I, and you know something, I really don't remember exactly how I became a sniper because my shooting uh, in the range was better than normal, but not great, great. But I was good in a prone position. I was very good in a prone position, and that's what a sniper mostly does. And I, I was all right. I did okay, you know. But we didn't have any special training like they do now, and you know, I, I mean, everything's so specialized. But uh, um, we were fairly close. At, you know, we had a, a long area, so I could move from one company to the next company, or I would be called to go to such and such an area that they may have uh, activities where they may have incoming, uh, where they may have mortars close by, or a recoilless rifle hidden somewhere, and uh, uh, maybe the sniper could take these guys that are shooting at us. Uh, so uh, not necessarily I would have to be here. I could be in Mineola somewhere. I could be in Westbury. Right. You know, I could be up and down the line where I was called for. So you like you try to take out, if someone's got a mortar position and there's a lot of trouble, they'd call you in and say, Get as close as you can see if you can If take possible. That. If possible. Mm -hmm. Without getting myself killed. Or, you know, we never went by one guy. I mean, we always went in pairs. Okay, so yeah. there were two of you all the time? Well, we had a spotter, which you call a spotter. Right. And sometimes you went through three or four, depending, you know. Um, right. But um, not, not, much, not so much with the mortars, because the mortars were behind the hills. See, the mortars mm -hmm. weren't close. Um, the mortars, you, you, the mountains are up here, and the mortars and the artillery are behind here, and they, they, they shoot over like this. So we're up here, but they have what you call uh, recordless rifles, uh, 75 record. And I'm saying ours. I don't know what they had, what their numbers were, mm -hmm. but they would be in caves, like, and, and they would shoot out of the cave, and they would go back in. See, they would hide. Now, if we could see where they smoke, if they weren't using smokeless uh, powder, and then we could maybe pick these guys off and stop it. And of course, sometimes that they had their own snipers, mm -hmm. and they were shooting at our guys. So, uh, combination of both. Uh, did you ever get an officer? I, I wouldn't know. I, I, we, I, I couldn't tell. I, the sniper scope that I had, and I don't remember the power. Um, it's, you know, did you ever look over across there with binoculars? The other? Yeah. Did you ever look across mm -hmm. with binoculars? Mm -hmm. You can see it much clearer, but you can't really, and you really can't tell. And, and the, they were, the, not the North Koreans, the Chinese were smart. The Chinese were very smart. The Chinese were very good. The North Koreans were haphazard. Um, and I didn't become a sniper until I became the Chinese. The Chinese wouldn't let you know if they were officers or they didn't wear anything that, any kind of insignias. And, you know, the guys knew who they were. I mean, the guys, all the guy has to do is open his mouth and he knows who's got authority. That's all. But uh, uh, I don't think so. I, I really don't know. Okay. Uh, now, in all these maneuverings now, uh, through the mountains and then north of Seoul and primarily dealing with the Chinese, um, did you uh, have to protect or run into uh, civilians? Uh, all the South Koreans? All, civilians? Yeah, all, the, the civilians were there. Uh, they were in their rice paddies and their rice fields. And by the way, we treated them professionally. We never had a problem with them. But they weren't where we were, or they were got, or they went away from there, and we really didn't have any problems, or we really didn't have anything to do with the civilians. If we got back in reserve, and we went back to Seoul, that was something else, because, uh, but we, we had no problems with the civilians, none, none at all, and they were not around where we were, they were not by the fighting, and if they were, they got out of there pretty fast, and it was very, very minimal, very minimal with the civilians, no. Except but if you went to the cities now. You went to the city because we we went into to, to Seoul. I didn't personally go into Seoul. We bypassed it, you know. Right. Some people went to in the front door of Chaminade, some people come in the back. You yeah. know? So they're the same place, but they're in different places. Yeah. Uh, now uh, let's say let's say you've gotten to a point 
you ever get to the point in the war where you could relax? Like you have a normal day without expecting the oh, sure. rifle coming oh, sure. at you? Yeah, oh, sure. Um, we were in reserve in Camp Tripoli. And um, <laughs> the government. We were reserved. See, you're on the line for several months. You call it on, I was in a line company called Online. This is the front lines. Right. And let's say you're on the line for two, three months or four months or whatever. Then you pull back. The 1st Marines, the 5th Marines, and the 7th Marines are make up the 1st Marine Division. So I was on, we were in reserve. And we were in reserve. We were um, maybe 10, 15 miles behind the line. And we were constantly training. So did I, we could relax back there? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, were you in a tent then? You're not. Oh, yeah, we were in a tent. It was a tent. Yeah. We were in a tent, yes. The whole squad or the company or the platoons, yes. And we could relax for, of course, we were constantly training, and we also had uh, scouts out, and we had um, uh, security, you know, uh, heavy security around the area, but we had no incoming and no artillery, so yes, we could have a no go to normal day. Okay. Now, how about the mail situation? No problem with the mail. The mail came up fine, and. Uh, the food, of course, it was okay. Sometimes we did go several times without food and water for several days, except what you're carrying on a canteen. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're carrying, uh, when we were in the attack in, back in uh, September, the first, the first time around was uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, I was all new, and, and I had uh, I had this guy that took care of me. So uh, the problem didn't start until March. Okay. Um, no. It, no, we, we've, I just want to make sure we got enough time on the tape, and we do. We're, do, we're doing fine. Um, were you uh, present when, when everything stopped, like when there was actually an armistice? Oh, no, that was a year after. Yes. Yeah, so I'm gone. I'm, I, I left there in September 1952. Okay. Actually, I think it was already in the I was there one year. So your official tour of duty was one year? Yes, they had a rotation system. Okay. I was in the 12th. Uh, rotation uh, draft, and I was there one year. But that was quite a jam-packed year. Oh, yes. You gone from Busan all the way to the northern part. Oh, yes, of, uh, yes. It was Seoul. Yes. And it was. Uh, I we really started to get going when we moved. Mm -hmm. When we moved from the North Koreans to the Chinese. other coast, and yeah. we were up against the Chinese. And that's when we started to have a lot of activity, a lot of action, and uh, and, and that's when the war started really started to get cooking mm -hmm. for us. Now, did you see any Chinese prisoners? Oh, yeah. We took several Chinese prisoners, and I turned to China. Uh, we, when I say we, of course, I'm always talking about our squad or our company or whatever. Right. But we, I was operating within this framework of this squad, and that's what the war was to us. Thirteen men, mm -hmm. basically, uh, and a platoon and a company. Yes, we took prisoners, um, and we took them in the wintertime, you know, but we turned them back over. In other words, we took prisoners from being on a patrol. They're on patrol, we're on patrol. There's ambushes, our ambushes, a combination. I'm sitting there uh, as a sniper and, and we take them coming. That's why I said we don't go in once. And that's pretty dangerous mm -hmm. when they're, you, if you can ambush their patrol and, and they go in sixes or fours or eights, a combination. So uh, we took prison several times and we turned them, we brought them back and, we, and they didn't give us any problem. We brought them back, and they turn them back to, to the company who sends them back to battalion, to division, to get uh, interrogated. Uh, but we weren't looking to take prisoners. Right? Right. That, that wasn't our job. Right. Yeah. Now, I, I heard this, all right? Now, from your knowledge, you just correct me or add to it or whatever, um, that in the beginning, our tanks couldn't match the tanks that we're using, the Russian tanks that we're using. Is that true at all? I had... I. We were not involved with the tanks at all, mm -hmm. um, because of the terrain that we were defending. The tanks couldn't even come near the mountains, and even the valleys of them. The tank battalions, I never had anything to do with the tank battalions, nothing. Mm -hmm. On either coast, they were in, now whether they were doing shelling from whatever area, I have no way of knowing, but it had nothing to do with tanks, nothing at all. Did you hear anything about Oh, I, I passed by the tanks many times. Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, but they didn't do anything because of the terrain. I, right. I mean, they can't go up the mountains, you know. And uh, so I, I really had no contact with the tanks, or, or their tanks. I had no contact with either the Korean tanks or the Chinese tanks who were using Russian equipment. I had no contact with them, none. 
Now, did you guys carry, uh, what would that be, bazookas at that time? I was a bazooka man. I was trained yeah. in 3.5 bazooka. Yes, I, 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 I shot the bazooka, but not at tanks. Right. And I was also trained as a flamethrower. I did that also. I was, mm -hmm. I was trained as a flamethrower. I was in a rifle company, but I was trained as a, a weapons. I, I was trained in weapons, like the sniper and, mm -hmm. and, and machine. I wasn't in machine guns. Weapons companies are machine guns, and a couple of friends in machine guns. But and the machine guns always traveled with the uh, uh, with the squad or the company or the battalion or, or, or platoon, whatever. Now, um, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning now. Um, you're trained on the east coast of the United States. Now, did, did you fly to San Francisco or something like that and get on a ship and go to Hawaii and then Hawaii to Japan or how did you do that? I went to Paris Island and I got a 10 day leave from Paris Island. I came home um, and I was home for 10 days and my orders read to go back to Paris Island. And from Paris Island we took a troop transport train from Paris Island to Camp Pendleton in California. Okay. And that's what we call a cattle car. We ate standing up. Oh. Ate standing up. How long did it take you, Dean? God knows. And we went through Texas and I never, and you see these Indian store, Indians, you know, the guys yeah, have yeah. only seen the Indians standing outside the store. <laughs> I thought we'd never get through Texas. That's how we got there. And we went right. to Camp Pendleton and that was for my advanced military training. Right. Advanced infantry, infantry training was done in California, in tent camp too. Okay. And then where did you go from there? Then from there we took a, a, a troop transport uh, ship and we didn't stop anyway. We went right from San Diego, right to Japan. We okay. Went, we went to Osaka, Japan. Right. We were in Osaka, Japan for a couple of days, and then we came around and we landed in Pusan. And from Pusan, I was flown in a C-47 uh, right up to my outfit that I joined the Third Battalion, First Marines. There. Okay. And that's all I got there. Now we're going to reverse the process. Uh, you're there for a year, so they're going to have a rotation. Okay, so now they're sending you where? Well, now, um, thank God I'm out. Uh, I'm out of there. And we're on a troop uh, transport again, coming back. And we landed in Treasure Island. And Treasure Island is um, an island right off uh, San Francisco. And there, we got the orders. And I don't remember exactly how this happened, but... <laughs> I got there, and I knew the guy that was giving out the orders. And he says to me, where do you want to go? <laughs> and he said that. He actually said that. I said, I don't want to go in the mountains. I don't want to up in the I don't want to go in training again. I don't want to go down to Camp Lejeune. So he says, I'll tell you what. I can send you to a rest and recuperation area in Scotia, New York, or I can send you to Lakehurst, New Jersey. I said, New Jersey? I want to go to New Jersey. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where New Jersey is. <laughs> so I said, where is Scotia, New York? He says, it's by Albany. Oh, I said, I know where Albany is. So I went to Scotia, New York, which was a naval supply depot, um, and I had a piece of cake there. It was uh, more of a, a guard duty, and I did, the f you see the t funerals on television? You yeah. see the I did that. I had, who was in charge of that. I was also a chauffeur for the captain, and I did good. And, and I had a chance to uh, go to um, PLC school, to leaders class. Mm -hmm. But I was getting married, and my wife wanted me out, and uh, it didn't come to pass. So your tour of duty is three years with the Marines? Three years. Three years with the Marines. Three, I, I was 18 once in, in um, Scotia, New York. Okay. In, in, okay. It was, we were guarding a naval supply depot. You know, it was mm -hmm. tremendous, tremendous place. Right. Now. Uh, when you were there, did you have a chance of going back to Korea? Like, if you could, you like resign for Korea, or they just said that's it. Oh you're no, there. you could go. You could go back. <laughs> you could go but, back. Yeah. <laughs> but a prerequisite to, for one of the reasons to go to PLC school, and uh, that's where you become a second lieutenant. Uh, one of the prerequisites is that you had to go back to Korea. What, are you crazy? I mean, I got it there once, so I'm not going back. You know, I mean, you know, these guys that go back from Vietnam and uh, two tours of duty or three, I mean, right. I, I marvel at them. I mean, uh, you know. But anyway, yes, could I have gone back? Absolutely. If I went to PLC school, could I? I would have to go back. Right. And I'm not going back. Okay, okay, fair enough. Once is enough. <laughs>
Uh, let's see. All right. Um, during the war, uh, what was daily life like? I know that you've explained much like with the trenches, but um, overall, like, what was your life during the war? Sometimes tranquility, like I'm sitting right here. Sometimes I was scared and I was shaking so much. It's, it's unbelievable. And then sometimes it, the adrenaline was going like I am. I'm up at the bottom of the ninth inning and I'm going to get a base hit to win the World Series. So you have tremendous ups and downs and you have tremendous times that you're just with it. Right now, the back of my, my back right now is going like this. It's fluttering because that's what happens. You get so scared and then the, the scariness leaves you and the adrenaline starts flowing. And then sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's like this. Because you're not fighting all the time, it's, that doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Of course, they can't fight all the time. But very, very difficult. But some guys got through it, some guys didn't get through it. And you have to feel sorry for the guys that didn't get through it. A lot of them will have mental problems, outside of being physical problems, about hurting, you know, being wounded, and they were going to scratch. Um, do you have any memories about the men and officers that you want to share with us? Oh, sure. I got a lot of friends that I had. Uh, we had, uh, we had fine leadership, but my dealings with the officers were almost negligible. But see, everything we had was encompassed in this platoon. You, you were living within that framework. I had a friend by the name of Costello um, that uh, he had his hair comes out of it, he had a hole in his hat. <laughs> he shot himself in the leg in a bunker, which I was in a, in a foxhole, and he woke me up in the middle of the night, he says, look what I did. <laughs> he shot himself in the leg. Uh, I had this friend, Colin Boyle, from Port Tucket, Rhode Island, and I had the best friend I had was uh, Sergeant McNesky from uh, Foley, Alabama, who taught me uh, how to uh, hunt pheasants with a carbine. And he had his leg blown off, and uh, I carried him on a stretcher to a helicopter. Uh, and I had another guy, Swingle, his um, father was a professor at Princeton. Uh, I had this sunny lawn, uh, several guys like that. Oh, some of them are in this picture, right? Uh, could you hold that picture up from this uh, to, the, to the camera? I don't know if you can see much of it. And, uh, and then see if you can point yourself out. I'm right over here in the corner. So you're going to be right in the, okay, with the rifle. With the rifle. And this is the guys you were, you this were is my squad. most this is, of the time. This yeah. is the squad that, that was there. But of course, then there's a the rotation system, and there's several of these men are no longer living. Mm -hmm. Several of them got wounded. Uh, and this guy right here, of course, it's difficult to see. He he was my friend. And he was the squad leader. Right where your finger is. Right where my finger. He was the squad yeah. leader, and he was there, and he was a squad leader for about five months. Mm -hmm. And he's passed away now. And he was a, he, he was a Silver Star recipient and a and a Purple Heart. How many of these people from that group? Okay, because you have another picture of a much larger. Oh, group. this this is the uh, this is boot camp, Paris Island. That's uh, boot camp. This, this right. is boot camp. This is this is the guys that we were in boot camp with. Mm -hmm. Now, from the that picture, because those people are going to be a lot closer to you. Yes. Um, how many of them did you meet after the war? Physically meet. Yeah. Face to face. Face to face. None. Right. But you corresponded? Uh, I went, uh, you have to understand that the draft, and don't, oh, by the way, all of these men from all different parts of the country, right. from Maine down to Florida, all the way out to Tennessee, uh, you know, out to the uh, Mississippi River. So we were from all different parts of the country. And we had a rotation system which was good and bad. We were there for 12 months. Um, so, although this is a squad at this particular time, two months from now, maybe five or six of these people are gone, right. or seven or eight. So, um, did I see any of them physically after I left? No. Or was I in contact with, excuse me, several of them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I in contact with a couple of them still? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Now, the ones you're in contact with now, I'll presuppose they're not in New York? No. Uh, two, one is in Ohio and one is in Kentucky. 
And, you know, we've sent Christmas cards and that kind of stuff, you know, keep up to that with pictures of when our kids got married and that was the end of that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I said to him one time, uh, you're going down to the Korean Memorial and oh, my wife is sick and, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the guy's name is Sonny Long, this guy right here. So I, I was in contact with him. Now, when you did go down to the Korean uh, Memorial, um, did you meet anybody there you knew? Uh, I went into the um, reunion and I asked, is anybody here from the 1st Marines? And nobody was there from the, at that particular time. Right, right. No, and I left a message and a medical tent. I had a very good friend of mine who was the corpsman, uh, who was 10 years older than us, when I got there. And he happened to become a very good friend of mine. His name was Gus Mark, and he was a corpsman. And uh, he had gone to Columbia, and he graduated at Columbia, and they called him back because he was in reserves, and he came back, and he went to Columbia Physicians and Surgeons, and became a doctor, and he used to come out to my house, and my wife used to cook him a turkey dinner, and he'd come out with his white car, and he sat in my backyard, and you know, he shot the baloney, and he said, uh, I said, you're going to practice by us? He says, no, I'm going home to to Pennsylvania, he did. He's passed away now. Daniel, did you receive any special medals or awards? And no, I, 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 I'm. I just got the no, normal things. No, no. I, what are some of the normal things you got? Uh, well, I got the Marine Corps medal. Uh, I got the Defense medal. I got the Korean medal. It's, it's there. It's, uh, but it's most of the guys got all of those medals. Uh, I was fortunate that I, I came back, I, I did my job, and I, I never got hurt. I got malaria, but uh, I never got wounded, and I was in combat many times, and I got uh, I didn't do anything more than any normal guy did, or any of the other guys did. There were some guys that, that were over and above, and, and they got their medals, and they certainly deserved them, but uh, I, I just got what I deserved. Now, the malaria, do you still have it? I don't have it. I um, we were taking quinine, and I got malaria is a disease where you get hot and cold. Mm -hmm. And I had it, and, and uh, I had it for about three weeks. And they sent me back to battalion, to bat battalion aid, and, and the doctor says, you look like you got malaria. And I says, you're taking your quinine pills? And I said, yeah, I'm taking them. So my temperature would spike up to 100, 304, and then bang, I would sweat it all out, and I would sh start to shake like this to get cold, and then he wrapped me up in blankets. He kept me in quinine, he shot me with penicillin, and that was the end of that, and sent me back. Now, uh, there's something there uh, that you received for the 50th anniversary. This year? Yeah, that. Would you read that? Sure. I'll first hold up the front of it to the camera. Okay, so we can see it's in Korean. <laughs> okay, now you're going to read the English. We won't ask you to translate to Korean. Dear Veteran, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War, I would like to offer you my deepest gratitude for your noble contribution to the efforts to safeguard the Republic of Korea and uphold liberal democracy around the world. At the same time, I remember with endless respect and affection those who sacrificed their lives for that cause. We Koreans hold dear in our hearts the conviction, courage, spirit of sacrifice shown to us by such selfless friends as you who enable us to remain a free democratic nation. The ideals of democracy for which you were willing to sacrifice your all 50 years ago have become universal values in this new century and millennium. Half a century after the Korean War, we honor you and reaffirm our friendship, which helped to forge the blood alliance between our two countries. And we resolve once again to work with all friendly nations for the good of humankind and peace in the world. I thank you once again for your noble sacrifice and pray for your health and happiness. Sincerely yours, Kim Dae Jung, President of the Republic of Korea. Thank you. Now, could you hold up the other book? Sure. And then, after he focuses on that for a minute, uh, open up to your section. This is a page dedicated to you. In Korean. In Korean, but we're interested in the page dedicated to you. Now, I don't know how well he focuses into the upper left-hand corner there, but that's where his picture is. And that, that's the... Uh, um, I was holding, well, you can't see it though, I, I was holding the bazooka right there. No. Oh. That's a 3.5. Okay. And the lower right hand corner, is that you also? Or is that no. someone else? No, that's not me. I'm on, I'm on this page only. Okay. 
Okay. Very good. Well, I got a couple more questions right, go uh, to, to ask. Um, one would be: Did you have any um, feelings, one way or another, about MacArthur? Uh, well, first of all, you know, I knew General MacArthur as a great leader for World War II. Um, what happened was, General MacArthur let the Marines hang tough up at the Chosen Reservoir. I am not a historian that I can be 100% accurate. I can only know what the, they were, I was told by the Chosen Marines. The Marines, the Army, and the Rocks, we call the Rocks the Koreans, they were moving in a skirmish like this, north. And the Marines got hung up out in front of the army, or which whatever side they were on in the flank, and the Koreans, so they were up in like a pyramid. They were up there all by themselves, up in the chosen reservoir. And MacArthur, who was the general, you put your name on it, you're the chief, he had us hanging up there, and we were in big trouble. And he said, don't worry about the Chinese, they're not going to come in. And then, of course, the Chinese came in all over the place, and they just really did a number. So did MacArthur have us hanging out? Yes, he did. And do the Marines like MacArthur? No, they don't. So they weren't upset when uh, Truman replaced them? No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Now, do you have any feelings about Ridgeway? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a grunt, so I, I, don't, I don't know what the generals have in mind, what, what they're thinking. We, we, we were 13 guys. We are 13 uh, kids. and uh, No, I have no, no thoughts on Ridgeway at all. Okay. All right. All right. Now, our two young interviewers here, you heard a tremendous amount of important information today. Is there any other questions you have or anything you want to reflect on? Because here he is. We've got him pinned right there in the corner on that chair, and this is our chance to, to get a hold of him. Do you, either one of you guys have anything you want to say or ask? What did, how did your family feel about you going to the war? And what, what did they think? Well, trepidation somewhat. Uh, not that they were against it. Uh, you know, don't forget the war, World War II was only over five years and, and you know, we were very uh, patriotic. And my family was not against me going. No. Okay. Um, how long did you serve in the war? I was in Korea for 12 months, and I was in a line company for 12 months. When you're in a line company, you're in a, you're in a combat outfit, and that's what a line company does. Okay. Um, what was your most memorable experience in the war? From the war, sorry. Something that strikes you from the war, maybe, or I don't know how to answer. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you can think of right now that you want to share with us? Because we we have a couple minutes left, and. If there's something that you think would be important for someone to know in the future, because that's where this tape is going, people are going to do research in this tape in the future. Well, I would like to say that uh, I think that uh, the Americans, uh, uh, well, let me rephrase that. I would like to say I can speak only for the Marines, I can only speak for myself, and the guys that I did, I was with, um, did the job that they were asked to do under the circumstances that we, we fought over there. Um, I was a 19-year-old kid. And, you know, I hate to keep coming back to I'm a 19-year-old kid, but that's what I was. Mm -hmm. I was not political. I, I, we, we didn't know anything about politics or why or what for. Was I gung-ho? Yes. Uh, was I ungo? Did I get ungo a gung ho? Yes, because I wanted to get back too. Uh, do I want to leave anything with? Uh, I, I was proud to be a marine. I was proud to. I'm proud to be an American right now. Uh, I'm proud for our troops over there, and I'm, I'm, you know I know they've got a tough nut to crack over there. And I was proud when the guys went in Vietnam. Was it right? Who knows? God only knows. 
I don't know what else I can say. I'm well, let me ask you this final question then. Uh, I can almost guess the answer, but I can be wrong. Did you ever get back to Korea? Oh, no. No, my sister-in-law asked me that all the time. I said, I'm not going back to the hills. I'm not going back to the mountains. No, I, I don't want to go back. Tell you, you have I don't, no I, desire I, to visit. I don't want to go back. I, 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 he asked me a question before, what's my most memorable deal? You know, I, 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 I got choked up on that one. I, I, I got some good ones, and I got some very, very, very bad ones. And, but I, I met some great people, and you know, I will not go back there. I, I don't want to go back there. Right. So like, when this 50th anniversary of the war hit, and you started receiving these different things from the Korean government, that didn't, like, you saw that and you said, that's nice, but I'm not going to go back to take a tour or anything. Uh, tell your brother Lawrence, I didn't get militaristic. I got married in 1953. Mm -hmm. I have four kids. I didn't get militaristic until 1996. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything. I had some very good times and I had some very bad times. And the only time I got militaristic again, if for a better word, is when we went down there to go to Washington. Actually, we went to Washington with my son. So now I get all the information because I signed up for that and I signed up for this. And uh, you belong to a veterans group? Um, I belong to VFW. I belong to the American Legion. I belong to the First Marine Division Association. I belong to George Company, Third Battalion, First Marine. So, but I'm not overly active in any of them. But, yeah. You know, I yeah. belong to. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, we're, I think we're going to wrap up this tape, and um, you know, we talked for almost an hour. Well, we did some talking too, but, uh, and really, it was uh, excellent because there's lots of things that you brought out to us that uh, we wouldn't understand. I mean, just your experience and how much you suffered with the cold. I mean, that's kids have to understand. You know, Korea is not uh, not the Philippines, right? You know, but as bad as the cold was, it was just as hot. Uh, although I, I'm making, you know, I, I don't know what you guys are looking for. See, I, I mean, I could go into into detail as far as, as being a, a sniper or any attack or, or, or doing this uh, as far as throwing hand grenades and shooting, etc. That's all there. And that was there. And it's still there. We didn't touch that. And that's okay, too. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying the cold was. The cold is bad. And the heat was bad. But when was you get incoming mm -hmm. artillery, or you get mm -hmm. uh, um, mortars coming on you, and you're, you know, and, and it's coming down on you, and you're going like this because you can't, you, you can't do anything about it, and, and you're scared. Yes, but then you don't get, you get unscared, and very, very bad. And that's where you get. That'd be a worse experience than the cold. Oh. Oh, not even close. I mean, it's cold here. Yeah, I put on, I put on my thing. I put on my hood. Right. Oh, sure. I just use cold because that's something I was. Of course, cold's nickel and dime stuff. No, sure. And the heat's nickel and dime stuff. This, that's the real stuff. But that's for another story. Well, thank you. And okay. we're just gonna, well, don't move yet. Okay, well, listen, <laughs> I, I want to thank the brother, and I want to thank his two helpers, and I want to thank the English teacher for asking me, and uh, thanks very much for having me. Thank you.